find and you can find during your spine exam. Okay, now moving on to close inspection. For me, this is you know for all all examinations these days. I look for scars, I look for swelling, I look for erythema, deformity, muscle wasting, specific to the spine as well. Abnormal hair distribution due to spinal bifida. Now, but if, if you're looking out for these three things in, this, in an exam situation, if you say look, this is the things I'm looking for, then you're pretty much only get full marks for close inspection. In terms of deformities of the spine, you know, you've got the kyphosis, which is you know, too much forward and leaning forward, but I say in a lordosis, if you are leaning back. All right, it's just important to know because if you when people are talking about the spine, these are the kind of terms that are used, you know, excessive kyphosis or they've lost the lumbar lordosis, etc. So it's quite good to be able to know what these terms mean. But again, it's not essential. It's kind of, one thing is scoliosis, which you know, you probably all are aware of and probably have all seen, but it's a lateral curvature of the spine. Okay, and then you've got the marked posture, and the question mark posture, sorry, which is a sign of ankylosing spondylitis, which I'll show you images and we'll go through cases later. So, and I'm probably teaching you guys how to suck eggs, but it's just important to just understand that this is the normal curvature of the spine, you know, you've got uh, cervical lordosis. The thoracic kyphosis, the lumbar lordosis. Okay, and then also what I think is also important whenever you get to assess joints or you're thinking of joint pain, it's quite good to understand the anatomy. Okay, so in the spine, you've got the vertebra, you've got this between the vertebra, you've also got facet joints, okay, which is slightly posterior as well. And then you've got the spinal cord and the spinal canal, and you've got the nerves really coming off. And that's pretty much the basic anatomy of the spinal, of the spine. And I think it's essential to understand that. And I'll again show you why, and I'll take you through my way of thinking when you know, patients present to me with a spine problem. And in terms of scars, I mean, there's not really that many scars you're going to find. You're going to find long scars like this, is not when this uh, young patient, and if you saw a scar like that, you can easily just say that this is a, a longitudinal scar down the center of the spine, which gives you access to the spine. And the only thing that comes to mind when I see someone with this kind of scar is this person's type of correction in their scoliosis. Because that's, to me, the only thing really I can I'll be able to find is it's got such a big scar going from the, you know, from the top to the uh, bottom of the spine. And you see smaller scars like this, and this is the something more in keeping with like a you know, discectomy or even like a you know, uh, partial fu uh, um, fusion as well. So there's a really, you know, really good scars you're really going to find on um, spine patients. Next, we're going to look, now feel, now I do feel down the center of the spine, okay, it's important because a lot of people will come saying I've got back pain. And I want to know whether it's a muscular back pain or it's more central back pain. Okay, now, and a lot of times it's actually quite difficult because a lot of people say, oh, the pain's across the entirety of my lower back. So that will go <laughs> from one side of the back to the other. The center's a bit sore, you know, the paraspinal area is a bit sore, but it can help you identify what the problem is because a lot of people do have muscular back pain. And so usually muscular back pain is not really self centered it's usually felt in the paraspinal muscles. But Again, in the exam process, the exam process, or even in real life, just make sure you feel that in the center of the spine and then feel the muscles. Because a lot of people can have, you say, you know, muscular back pain. After feel, move on to move. Don't worry about all these degrees. Again, what I just do is tell the patient to, to follow me and do what I do. So I'll bend, I'll flex my neck, extend, and I'm just looking at the patient, see, can they do as much as I can? Because I know I've got a it. And if they can't do it, then it shows that actually something is very is abnormal. Does this add a lot to the, uh, you know, does it, does it add a lot to, to age of diagnosis? Possibly, probably not, okay, but, um, you know, certain, certain circumstances, for example, if you have to clear the spine of someone in a trauma situation, you still have to ask them to do all these movements to make sure that you've got no pain. Uh, but there are certain people who have limited range of movement in the spine, such as like if you've got like, arthritis in there, cervical spine, you know, limited range of movement, again, but you know, it wouldn't really change the diagnosis, which is good to know and good to know how to examine. The same really with the thoracolumbar spine, you know, just these movements, 
And I think the most important one I think that most people will learn at medical school is yeah, being able to flex, okay? Because it's that, you know, it can be a sign in a Sherbert's test, to sign of agros and spondylitis. And I think that's probably, in all my time, the one that's been the most useful, the one that I've checked the most. And then just going uh, to Sherbert's test, which I'll show you the picture because that's a little bit more clearer. But you know, this is a, a test to look at how much flexion the, pa the patient has in their lumbar spine. Okay, so you look, if you go at the back, everyone can feel your posterior superior iliac spines. At the back, you draw a line across them. And then tape measure, you go 10 centimeters above, five centimeters below while they're standing upright. And when they bend over, that distance should increase by at least five centimeters. Okay, and it can just be a, you know, a screening test really for ankylosing spondylitis. And then off one look, feel, move. This is our first special test. Next special test, and this is probably one that I probably do the most often when people get back pain, is straight leg raise. And what you do is literally get the patient to lie down flat, and then you, as the exact, you as the doctor, lift the leg up. And you know, where you lift it up to, I lifted it up to roughly about 30 to 45 degrees. I'll hold it there and answer if the pain in their leg worsens. Okay, because if this is a classic sciatica, this will worsen their pain. Okay, and so this is for me is quite a good sign to see people or patients with sciatic pain. I do this test by lifting up their leg, it worsens their pain. And I'm like, look, you've got, no, you've got. No, barn door sciatica. I think to me it's pretty specific. Okay, and normally what I would say is, you know, the pain or the burning sensation they feel in their leg, is it worse when I lift their leg up? And they'll say yes. And when I put it down, they say it gets better. I'm like, well, you've got sciatica. Right. Next test you can do is this the femoral nerve stretch test. I'll be perfectly honest, I don't think I've ever done this. Because uh, not many people come. You know, saying they've got pain in the femoral nerve distribution, mainly it's the sciatic nerve distribution. But again, this is a special test that you can do. But I'm, it's so rare that I've seen, I've, seen, I've personally not seen someone come or present with femoral nerve um, pathology. And of course, to end, neurovascular status, full upper lower limb exam. Now again, PR, if you're considering, if you're worried about quality equina, of course, you'll do a PR exam and then examine, you know, you know hips above and below. Look, examine the shoulders if someone's got upper limb um, signs, and then examine the hips as well for lower limb. Right. And that's pretty much the spine exam. Okay. Any questions at all? Any questions? Nope. All right. So we shall um, just move on. So, this is a great um, score. This is called the Asia score. So for the neurovascular exam, a lot of people say, oh, I'll do a neurovascular exam. What does that actually consist of? It actually consists of this. And I know this looks very busy. There's sort of a lot on it. But I, what I will do, I just want to bring your attention to two parts, okay? You have sensory and motor, all right? Now, the sensory part of this Asia score, it shows you where you need to touch test every diff each different dermato, okay? So this is absolutely fantastic because it just tells you, look, this is the one spot you need to test to test, oh, it's, as this patient got sensation to C5, C6, C7, etc. okay? Same the legs as well, fantastic. And also that it's, you know, diagnostic because if the patient, if a patient comes and says, actually, well, I've got you know, loss of sensation in the L5 dermato, then you can then, Look at this. Yep, yeah, I can identify this as likely, you know, alpha, an L5 dermatomal issue, pointing, you know, pointing your diagnosis in that way. For me, this is, you know, essential because everyone agrees with this Asia score. If you look in different textbooks, uh, I tell you to, you know, um, test, yeah, the myotome dermatomes in a different way. This is just the international standard, and it's very good. So. I just take you, know, you can find it on Google and I just saved it to my phone. And so when I was on call and there's a patient, you know, potentially a spy patient I need to examine, I just did this. And yeah, I was just, just I was just commenting that, Kevin. Uh, 
like throughout my night shifts this weekend, I've used mm -hmm. it daily. It's a very reliable, systematic, diligent way of approaching the the spine examination, and it sets a baseline when they're admitted, when they're seen by the orthopedic team. You've done it properly, and then any deterioration from there, they can just redo the Asia and compare against the admission one. It's a it's a amazing chart. You just Google Asia Asia chart, and first and second hit on Google should be the PDF, and you can just download it, print it from any printer in the hospital, put it on the patient yep. notes, stick a label on it, and it's it's you can't do better than this. Indeed, indeed. Literally, I mean, remember when I found this. I think I found it. I mean, even definitely before I was read some of that. I was like an F two or C T one. I remember finding this. I thought this is just perfect. Had everything there, and so you can just write. You, know, you can print this off if you know if you can, or if you don't, you can just write. Look, I'm going to test you know, C five, C six. You know, just five out of five. Nothing. You can read it right out and said anybody looking at this would just say, okay, this person knows what they're doing. It's done perfectly there. And it, you know, if you look here in a motor, it tells you it's a C5 elbow flex, a C6 wrist extension, C7 yeah. elbow extension. And uh, I think on the other side of the sheet, it even gives you a few insights. Like if you've seen this, it might be this level of injury or incomplete, partial, mm. complete. Yeah, I think on the back, it also provides you some insights. Yeah. We, by the end yeah. of the session, like we can try and bring one up. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Very good. Yeah. So, so yeah, this is fantastic. Save it on your phone, put it in your images, save it as a favorite, and so you'll now will never be lost ever. And then uh, the end of neurovascular examination. Okay. And then my phone said, you know, explains it on the Asia score, but yeah, these are pretty much, you know, my tones, which you just need to do specifically in the lower limb. This is you know, again straightforward things that you can do. Easy, but it's on the Asia score, so you don't. In essence, you don't really need to remember. I mean, I we remember it because you do it so often. And of course, you need it for the exams, but you know, you can't. You think oh, I'm not going to remember this. You have the Asia score in your back pocket on your phone, and so you don't. You don't have to remember it. All right. So what we'll do, we're going to we'll start to go through some clinical um, scenarios. All right. Now, just before we start, has anyone got any questions? And feel free to unmic yourself so text on the chat box uh, and, uh feel, feel free to speak now anyone nope okay no problem okay so we'll carry on we'll carry on so so when i you know, i mentioned earlier about trying to well it's even difficult to understand but trying to kind of categorize the thing. So, you know, I think, no, most of you guys are here, medical students. So someone said to you, okay, a patient comes with chest pain. In your mind, how do you try and, you know, how do you think about it? What's your diagnosis? How do you, what's your way of thinking? And when I think of it, something with chest pain, I think, well, is this a cardiac cause? Is there a respiratory cause? Is it an upper GI cause? Is it a musculoskeletal cause? And then go from there. And it's the same thing really in orthopedics. I think, you know, I think, you know, especially with the spine, okay, is this a problem with the bone? Is it a problem with the disc? Is there a problem with the spinal cord? Or is it a problem with the peripheral nerve, nerves coming off the spinal cord? Is it a muscular problem? Or is it a degenerative or an inflammatory problem? And it's kind of like a surgical sift. Now, a lot of these things, a lot of problems will go through don't just sit into one of these boxes okay so a lot of disc problems would actually that can also cause a peripheral nerve problems so not everything can just fit into one bit but i'm not going to think of you know, anything in any joint really that tend to try and break it up into okay, what part of the joint could potentially be infected and what could cause that problem okay this is like a surgical sieve again you know with the more experience the more times you see things you go oh yes no i can I can now categorize this, but this is, you know, I think before when I've tried to talk to people about the spine, they think, oh my gosh, there's so many things to it. But actually, if you break it down into these, you know, categories, it does make a bit more sense. Okay, you can actually think, okay, you know, I think this is a, you know, a predominantly a bone problem, a predominantly a disc problem, a spinal cord problem, an 
mean, you can actually understand how all of these, you know, there's lots of, what's the word, lots of, um, it's not, yeah, you know, it's a, things really don't, not always fit into one uh, section. So there's a lot of overlap, that's the word I'm looking for. All right, so why do we need to talk about the spine? Well, I actually only found this out today, but there's a national back pain pathway. I was just looking up randomly about you know, trying to find some statistics about back pain. Actually, it says here that 11% of the total disability in UK population is due to lower back pain. And I think for those of you guys who do work in, wherever you work in, GP, if you work in ED, anywhere, you will see people with back pain. Okay, back pain is unbelievably common. And one of the good things that, you know, when I work in A&E is I pretty much see all the back pain patients because nobody else really wants to meet them or, or, or wants to see them. So they end up being a lot of pain. They end up being quite a little bit, sometimes a bit moany, but that's because you know, they're in a lot of pain. But people find it difficult to examine patients with back pain okay? because they need to know hey, what that I'm looking for, what are, the, what are the things that I need to see, what are I mean, a lot of people are scared of back pain. But, you know, as this pathway says it, it's important that we need to identify and be able to refer any potential serious pathology. Right? We'll go through some of the things you said in the cases we've got. Okay. Another thing which is very important, and one thing that I was told during my when I did spines at Derby, is that there's a lot of people out there, specifically people like this, who are looking for when people make mistakes with back pain, specifically called the aquina. Okay, and they call it a quina, I, I can't even remember when I was in medical school, I can't even remember that being poor very well, but actually it's a, quite a significant problem. Okay, and I think it's, it is frequently missed, and because it's missed, and because it can be quite disabling, you know, the compensation for um, called a quina is massive. All right, so it's important that you know, people that we can understand back pain. Of course, not everyone needs to be referred to the spinal surgeon. Not everyone needs an MRI scan. But it's important to talk about, think about you know, what are the signs, what are the things I'm looking at you know, when I examine someone, or what, what, are, what are the things that um, you know, could be the red flags, which I think actually I need to probably you know, refer this patient on or be seen sooner rather than later. All right. Good. Okay, so We'll go through some cases now. We've got, how many have we got there? We've got a couple of people. So I'm going to encourage some people to put their microphones on. Anyone? I think, I think Andrada will definitely, because she's a formal uh, now orthopedic okay. F1, so she also. Okay. Please, please don't put pressure on me. <laughs> <laughs> It's not pressure. It's it's active encouragement. Imagine it's a no, new no, no, <laughs> no problem. So just as I said, as I mentioned earlier, guys. So I would encourage every one of you guys to talk about. And we'll start with you. We'll start with me. And I said it. This is so like do not do not feel like you're under any pressure at all. We're just gonna have a talk through a case. And yeah, I'll ask some questions. You give me some answers. We'll just if this is gonna be the discussion there's nothing here is a silly answer okay nothing at all is a silly answer what i'm just want to get from you guys is get into this and into a way of thinking and you know this can, you know, and also we can talk through these are all of these patients the real patients that you know i've seen and when i and i feel that they're common presentations okay so not that i've seen it once as i see actually you know, more than once and this is something that you know at least you know, if i should show it to you here today you be like, ah, I'll, I'll be able to recognize that next time. All right? Cool. So we're going to our first case. So first case is an elderly patient uh, who had a fall, fell forward and hit her forehead. She presents bruising to her forehead. She also complains of a headache and neck pain. Now, Andrade, let's say you're, you're the F1 doctor in ED. Okay, what, what, what are your thoughts about this patient's presentation or what potentially could be happening? Um, <clears throat> well, I, first, uh, I, I would first ask the patient um, the circumstances 
like mm -hmm. the circumstances are falling uh, yeah. was it due to anything or what was it all of a sudden good good yes yeah, yeah, yeah good yeah you never know this patient might have had an mi and they were falling this person could have had you know all sorts of stuff but let's just say no they were just they just lost their balance they just fell yes. hit their head against the table got a large bruise in the front of their head and they're complaining of headache and neck pain. What do you okay. think? Did, did the patient lose consciousness or? Uh, no, she didn't lose consciousness. She fell to the ground and got immediately got this like headache and a pain in her neck. And then her family have brought her in. Okay. Is that a uh, headache and neck pain right now or was it mm -hmm. the fall? No, no. So she got next. Yeah. So as soon as she fell, she had the headache, she had the neck pain. Right. Um, what, do, what do you think potentially could happen? Or what, what things are you concerned about? Let's say that. Still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah, just. Yeah. No, that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> so, this is, so, this is not an uncommon reason for people to come to admit to ED because elderly people fall all the time. So she's falling, she's sitting in the front of her head and she's playing with the headache and neck pain. Yeah, if it, if it would be like an exam setting, a good way of always answering these questions just for your own knowledge. Uh, hey, hey, uh, like you could that formally say, I would assess the patient A to E, blah, 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 and then focus on the most obvious abnormality which would be the headache and the neck pain full neurological examination age chart for example you could uh you could document like all of the upper cranial nerve examination and then yeah think about investigations what do you think what do you what do you think we might be concerned in this stage so it could be the spinal cord affected because we're talking about the spine mm -hmm. Good, yeah, good, yeah. So yeah, it could be a spinal cord. Okay. So is it and I think what um uh, and uh, Andrea just said there, Andre just said, is you know, really whenever you, you have to uh, I mean you'll you'll get used to this so, you know you know you just you know, start to be F1, but you'll know as you start progressing through kind of more senior, you'll know there's a like a way to start answering, you know, these kind of questions. And this is the kind of stuff that you potentially would get like in a viva kind of setting. Okay, and I say, you know, what would you do for this patient? It's always first, you know, I take a history. And then the history, maybe the, the, the pertinent things I want to know is you know, things you said there. What were the circumstances of this form? You know, did she have, you know, any chest pain? Was there was it a seizure, etc. going on that one? Then you can say, okay, she had a headache. You know, was there loss of consciousness? Does she have any abnormal neurology now? Has she, has she had any vomiting? So it's fine thinking, oh, has she got some sort of intracranial damage? Then you can move on to the neck pain. So, oh, yeah, her neck pain, and she noticed any changes in her hands and legs, any changes in the neurology. You know, can she move her neck? All right, now, those are and then, and then from then, you can get set up to a full you know, examination, cranial nerves, peripheral nerves, examine the, examine the spine, and then move on to investigation. So it's always history, examination, and then investigation. So if I told you, Andrade, that this lady, She's complaining a headache. You know, that she's not really vomited. But her family says oh, she, she, she's been a bit, a little bit dozy since the fall. Like she's not fully with it. Okay, but no, G, no GCS is 15 out of 15. The patient, patient complaining of really bad neck pain and is reluctant to move her neck. Okay, so knowing that, and they say neurology is all normal, everything's all normal, but it's just she's got this headache. And she's reluctant to move her neck. So if you move the neck, it causes makes the pain work. What again, what 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 would you be worried about? And what investigation, plural per se, could could you potentially do to help you find what, what's going on? So I would go for a CT and an MRI. Okay. okay. Cool. So now this is again, these are all yeah, these are just trying to get you to think and Oh, we have to say that one thing, you guys are going to be doctors soon, so you know, you'll see these kind of patients. You know, and, you know, you'll, you say, you'll be the ones who are going to make decisions. Fantastic. You're in a CT. What is it, why is it you'd get a CT scan? 
because you cannot what? really see um, the spinal cord on an X-ray. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So the CT scan is very good at looking at bones. Okay, so if you're concerned that there's a bony injury, which potentially could be, you look at injuries, your neck pain, so that's a good way. Uh, the CT is only a CT of the head. See if there's any intracranial damage. And I think nowadays, an elderly patient, if they've had significant falls to their head, and see a lot of these patients are aspirin or clopidogrel or a DOAC or a warfarin, they just get a CT scan, um, you know, because the mechanism of injury alone. But I think some of this is a headache and neck pain, yeah, you know, CT scan, I think, be very useful in the initial circumstance. Now, you said the MRI scan, again, you know, the MRI scan would be even more fantastic, but the issue of getting an MRI scan is that it's quite expensive. Also, it's quite difficult to get an MRI scan urgently. Okay, if you go to most hospitals, you get a CT scan like that, but with an MRI scan, it's a bit more difficult. So, you know, the radiologist will say, has this patient got any abnormal neurology? You say, no, they'll say, you're not having an MRI scan. And that, that's pretty much how your conversation would go. All right, because it's you know, pretty much, you know, if you get an urgent MRI, on the spine, they need to have some abnormal neurology. So that's what you that's what you could look at most. Okay. So, so if you this patient did have abnormal neurology, I would 100 agree. Yeah, we, would, we would need an MRI scan at some point. But the quickest, probably easiest thing to get is a CT scan. Well, the CT scan will run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's always someone there. All right. So you don't get a CT scan for this lady. All right. Because you think well, this headache and reluctant to move her neck. Well, now. Andrade, you're doing fantastic so far, okay? So we'll move on. Now, what would we move on? We're going to move on to this. This is a CT scan. Andrade, I saw that look in your face, and I was like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Now, don't run out. Again, then you look at the two. I'll talk you through it. I'll talk you through it, because it's important. Again, I can't expect you to just know what this is if you've never seen it before. So you've got, you look at two views, okay? The one on the left hand side, I don't know if you see my you see my arrow, you see my cursor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. You see my cursor. This is, you know, you're looking straight on. All right. So this is, you're standing in front of the person, you're looking straight on. Okay, so you can see the you know, the uh, vertical bodies, you can see uh, lateral processes, etc. Okay. And then this on this side is looking you're looking side on. Okay, so this someone's been cut from the you know down straight through the middle. So this is the back. So you see the spinous processes here. This is to be the back of the head, and this is the front. Okay. So you look at two things now. Looking at this, could you see an abnormality somewhere? So uh, on the lateral view, so to say, there is mm -hmm. a sort of like an extra bone anteriorly, like a small. Are you talking about this one here? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay, cool. Any other abnormalities? Um, oh, uh, between the first vertebra and the second one, the space is kind of disrupted. Okay, now which space is that? Is it on this view or on that view? Uh, the second view. This one here? And where are you looking yeah. at? Are you looking at this? Yes. Okay, very good. I mean, look, fantastic, again, so you picked up the problem. Just there, okay. And you see that doesn't look quite right. And so mm -hmm. how are you doing this, Andre? You are just a tech wizard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is fantastic, right? Yeah, I mean, so it's fantastic. What you found here, so that's a fracture. Okay, what you looked mm -hmm. at there is a fracture. All right, and it's important to know this is actually quite a common injury in elderly patients who fall and hit their head. Okay, because what happens, and you know, when you saw that extra piece of bone, that bone and that, that's actually part of the C1 vertebra, and it's a ring. So that's the front, that's the front of the ring, that's the, set, that's the back of the ring, per se. And then this was, you know, what's highlighted there, C2. Okay, and the C2, if, if you imagine that, all right, so let's go to the next picture, because it, this explains it a little bit better. But if you just go to here, let's go to the next picture, sorry, boss, let me leave it there. All right, this is Atlas, which is C1, and it's a ring, okay? C2 has this bit that comes up, they call it the dens of the odontoid, and what it allows you to do, it allows your neck to spin, all right? So 
so it gives you a lot of rotatable movement there. The issue is that if you fall and hit your head really hard, this front part of C1 will break, this bends it off. And it's actually really common, like really common. Okay, LB patients that have fallen with neck pain, they have this a lot, okay, as we saw. And this is something to just be aware about because it has been easily missed. It has been easily missed. And what it presents us is, sorry, like that, okay. And if the CT scan, that is what it looks like. Okay, now in terms of management, right, like you can imagine just where this is in your body. This is like really high up. I mean, your spinal cord is just back here. Okay, your brain is here. Is this a part of the body you want to be operating on? Absolutely not. All right, you want to be leaving that well alone. So if most of these fractures, specifically because they happen in the elbow, and a lot of times, if you look at this fracture, yeah, there's a crack in it, but the bone hasn't moved too far away. You know, it's close by. So we all heal. So that's why you see people wearing collars, okay? This is another common injury in, so people who dive into shallow pools, you see them on the holiday, people dive into pools, they hit their head, boom, and then they're paralyzed. This is the reason why they get this kind of fracture. Okay, it's very quite common. So yeah, you see this kind of thing, right? It's called a don't a don't tight fracture. Anyway, Andrea, that was fantastic. Very good, very good. So we will move on to the next one. The next one I've got in here is Antonia. Is Antonia there? Is he there? No. <laughs> Maybe. Antonia. Yeah, I'll tell you, you may yeah. be there. You may be there. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, sorry. Fantastic, Antonio. So, as I said, no pressure, no stress. We're just going to go through these again, scenarios that you see. All right, so, this is one that I saw not too long ago, actually. So, you're here. Motorcyclist. Right. Side on collision with car. Brought in by ambulance. Okay. Um, and which complained of neck pain at the scene. Uh, because it's very neck pain, they put them in a collar, they put them on the blocks, they put them on the spinal board, which is what you know, all the emergency people would do if they have if any concern of a spinal injury, the collars, blocked, spinal board, just so everything is kept still so that they can transfer it to hospital. All right. So, again, yeah, as um, Andre said before, yeah, always go initially when you do the trauma patients, you know, you're going an A to E assessment. All right. A, B, C, D, E, airways, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. All right now, let's say, look at this, this patient's alert. He's complaining of neck pain. Okay. Now, just from this history alone, Antonio, what, what are you concerned about? We have to access the neck and see the spinal cord, as you said. Okay, and what, 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 what is it? What, what are you concerned about this? What concerns you with a motorcyclist uh, that's been hit with a car? Not a pain in the neck. Uh, pain. Fracture of any. Yeah. Yeah. Any, uh, yeah. Sure. Of any cervical yeah. spine. Yeah. Um, so remember the, when we went back, if we go back, where are we back? Chris, let's go back a bit. Oh, oh, let's go way back, actually. There we are. This. When anyone, oh, there, when anyone talks, whenever anyone, if there's any patient that comes with a problem around the spine, that these are the kind of things I think of. Is there a bony injury? Was there a fracture? Is there a dislocation? Is there a disc problem, spinal cord? Is there a peripheral nerve? And I keep, always have those things in the back of my mind, just because you never know. And so, you know, with this history, though, it's trauma. So clearly this isn't an infection. Clearly this isn't metastasis. Yeah. Someone's had a trauma. So yeah, the first thing on my mind of is there a fracture? Okay, all right. So this patient's there, he can move his limbs. Okay, but he's got severe neck pain. All right, severe neck pain. What investigation would you want to get on this patient? First, maybe normally they come with a collar, or cervical collar, maybe, I don't know, from the... They come with a cervical collar because of the accident, yeah. maybe. So yeah. I, what, what investigation would you like to do? Because you're concerned with the fracture in the neck. So what, what 
what, what investigations do you do? You have to do a CT scan, an X-ray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so you know, in the trauma setting, you know, X-rays. I mean, you've seen X-rays of the spine, which I'll show, show you pictures. But X-rays sometimes are difficult, difficult to interpret. Okay, so they, you know, so in essence, a CT scan is actually a lot better. If you've got a high suspicion, the CT scans a lot, lot better because it's, mm -hmm. it's quick. I mean, you know, X-rays rapidly quick, but a CT it just tells you all the information you need. It's fantastic. So in this kind of circumstance, where someone's had a very high energy injury, complaining of neck pain, does this go? No, just go straight for a CT scan rather than do an X-ray. Okay. okay. And especially in a trauma situation, that's when they say you know, trauma CT head to toe because this, so this motorcyclist may have been hit at 60 miles an hour. He's complaining of neck pain. That might be a distraction injury. He may also have you know chest injuries, abdominal injury, but because his neck pain is so severe, it's a distracting injury. So. A patient like this, they'll just say, look, put them through the scanner, scan them head to toe, see what's there. All right, so you put them into the CT scanner, and this is the image you get. All right, now, just looking at that image, is there anything that you think is not quite right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a disalignment of the, the vertebra. Yeah. Of... Fantastic, fantastic. So Before you look so you look at the alignment, and yeah, if you look at the anterior, the, the, the line at the anterior aspect of the vertebral bodies, you can see that there's some discrepancy here. Yeah. Right. Again, at the posterior, and you see the discrepancy here. Okay. All right. And if you look at this, now this, these are what they call the facet joints. Okay. And these are the facet joints. You can see, but there's an issue here. Okay. Now. You also be very if, if I saw this 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 scan, I'd be very concerned. Okay. Why would I be very concerned? Of uh, um, the medulla, like the breaking of the collapse. Like for Did the I... when you have the this kind of uh, fracture, you could uh, cut the medulla, like for loss yeah, so, of sensibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, you know, the top part of the, the cervical spine here pretty much isn't really connected to the lower part. I mean, it's just unstable, floppy. The other thing that I look at is, yeah, but it's blue liners. That's where your spinal cord lies. Yeah, spinal cord, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, your spinal canal should be, should be wide. Around this area, you can see the spinal canal would be pinched severely. So if I saw this, I would honestly think this person's got a spinal cord injury. Because I can't imagine that your spinal cord, which is quite thick, approximately, is going to be happy going through this tiny space here. Okay, so I'd be like, "Oh, this is it." So, what do you think? Knowing that, what do you think should be the management of this patient? So, you call the spine team, of course. You get spine team. Look, this guy. Here. What do you think the spine people would, would have to do to this? I have to operate or something. Yeah, and what, what, do you, what do you think their aim would be when they operate? Because of course, it, you say you can't even like this. What they would try to, to take the, the pressure from the spinal cord and try to, yeah. to reduce Good. it. Yeah, yeah, so I've seen, I've seen this a few times, and again, this is not a common injury. This is actually, let's say, rare-ish. I've seen it a few times. So what has happened is you can see that the the spinal cord has come forward here, but also this facet joint, this should be here, okay, like the rest of the muscle. So like it's been moved forward. So what you have to do is reduce it, take it, put this back over here. And literally what they do is literally put traction on the neck, on the head, to pull it so that this bit now goes, this little bit now goes straight over here and it goes back. There are other things they need to do, but in essence, they need to reduce it. They also need to stabilize it because it's lost its stability from the injury. You know? But that's just, this is just something, again, like, you, you, know, you probably won't see many of these in your entire life, but yes, these are the kind of injuries that you can get them with um, you know, high energy trauma, especially to the neck. All right. Now, again, in this circumstance, as you said earlier with Andrea, if this patient had, have normal neurology, which they probably would. 
they would probably get an urgent MRI scan as well. Okay, but again, that's for the spinal team to decide. But then that is an, an indication as to why to get an MRI scan. Okay. So, yeah, you see there the colors. There's a very narrow area here, and that spinal cord is just not going to be able to, it's not going to be happy in that. Okay, so you're, as a spinal surgeon, they would say, but we need to you know, just re reduce this, get the spinal cord well aligned, and then see what happens after that. Anyway, a very good answer. Very good. Yeah. You got there. Okay, next I've got Fatihi. Fatihi? Have I spelled that correct? I think I've pronounced that correctly. It's Fatini? It's Fatini, yes. Fatini, Fatini. Pleasure. Pleasure. So again, Hi. we'll go through. Again, don't worry. We'll talk through it. Okay, no I can right try, but my English are not so good. <laughs> yeah, you're what? My English, because I'm from no Greece. Worries. I will try. <laughs> oh, look, hey, that is fantastic. You just. Uh, I know try, some try. Greek. I know some Greek sayings, uh, but I only know the bad stuff. That's all they. Do. That mean, <laughs> That's all the foreigners know. <laughs> no, I know. I know Calispera, Calimera. Oh, yeah. okay, the best. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so this is we're going to the next one. So this one is this actually happened while I was at medical school. Actually, at a house party. So we're at a house party. Uh, and one of my friends was, I think, on the balcony. And literally, this guy done fell from the balcony. Okay, just la I can't remember how he landed. I think he landed just on his back. Right. But didn't want to move. Complaining of back pain. Right. Now, what, what, what would you be concerned about? What would you be worried about in this patient? Is it high? The balcony? Yeah, yeah. Or the... yeah, yeah. So it's one floor. So I don't know, like three meters, four meters. Okay, for yes. uh, his spine, because we don't know how he land, how he land. Mm -hmm. so... Mm -hmm. so what what would you be worried about? Someone falling from this, falling like in this picture like that, what would you be worried about? I don't know. You don't know? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. So, he's... Head and neck in the Oh, sorry. Who said that? Uh, me, James. Hi. Hi, James. Uh, uh, yeah, um, a, a head or neck injury, because he's falling backwards. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so you must be concerned. Yeah. Is there an injury to the head, an injury to the neck? These fallen and hit there and they're falling down. So, that's exactly what uh, uh, happened. That my friend fell and did, just could not get up. Couldn't get up. Can move his legs, can move his hands, merge his time, but just could not get up. So, of course, we take the hospital. Okay, and what, what investigation do you think they did for him? Anyone? MRI, head and neck. Okay, yeah. But said, as I said, I said, his neurology was normal. So the radiologists were like, nah. Yeah, I posted on the on the chat just so people know. Um, there's guidelines usually on when to scan people. I mm. posted the CT head nice guidelines, but there's the same for the trauma CT series head uh, mm -hmm. guidelines. For example, on the CT head, you can see in the chat, uh, if they meet any of these criteria, as in the patient that you're seeing in ED or been referred to your, to your service, like any signs of basal skull fractures or a suspected open skull fracture or a GCS or the Glasgow coma scale of less than 13 or a sudden drop, in any of GCS. So if they meet any of these, they they should get, in this case, a CT head, but there's the same for a trauma CT, um, but it depends. So let's say if it's a 10, 10 floor high fall, they'll get a trauma CT. Even if they're completely fine, asymptomatic, they would get a trauma CT because it's 10 floors high. But this one's mm -hmm. one floor high, but I think with head and neck, not able to walk, he'd still get possibly a trauma CT. 
I, I was also thinking because he's drunk as well, he, he might have altered GCS because yeah. of that and you know, taking away from the head injury that he might have. But yeah. Indeed. And yeah, that's smart. Like literally anybody who's drunk who's got a potential head injury, they get a scan of the head. Yeah. Or poor historians. So, so drunken yeah. people, dementia patients, people yeah. who you can't trust. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You can't trust. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's tough. So, weird. so Fatayini, you still there? You're still yes, here. <laughs> you still here. That's no, fantastic, man. Uh, so, yeah, you know, as the patient will come in, you, you know, you'll be concerned. Is there some sort of fracture? Is there some injury to the spine? As I said, his neurology is normal. So, you know, we're, we're happy he probably doesn't have a nerve injury, a spinal cord injury, but he won't move because of his back. So, again, you're concerned of a fracture. So, you get a CT scan. Okay, now. Okay. I'm going to show you a CT scan. I want you to concentrate on the image to the left. Okay. And look at this image to the left. Yes. Is there anything abnormal that you can see? So again, we look, this is, but this is the front. This is the back. You can see the vertebral bodies. And then you can see the spinous processes at the back. This gap is where the spinal cord will be in. Mm -hmm. But for Jenny, is there any, anything you can... Any ab any any anything worrying or concerning or abnormal I on the scan? I think I can see fractures, but I'm not sure. Okay, Which, where, where do you think you see them? Um, in the third of the top. I uh, I don't know which one. This one? No, the yes, this, this one? one. Yes. Cool. What about this one? This one as well. Okay, good. Like yeah. in the top, a little. In bit. the top, in, like yes. complete. Fantastic. All right. So one great way for you to be able to read these scans is that whenever you look at this is in what is called the sagittal slice, but when you're looking at this, all right, these bones here are the sacrum. Okay, so S1, S2, S3. All right. Okay. So you always know the sacrum is this. Right? Literally the bottom, bottom one is sacrum. So therefore, you just have to count upwards. This one's going to be L5, L4, L3, L2, A, L1, and that'll be T12. Okay. Okay. So whenever I look at a scan, I always I need to I need to know where the sacrum is, and the sacrum is always joined up. Then we're free because it's sacrum here. So once I know that, then I know that okay, this one's definitely L5, L4, L3, L2, L1. And as you correctly said, you know L1 looks normal, looks like a nice square. But this one, yes. something at the top, this doesn't look normal, okay? Mm -hmm. and you can see that it's lost, it's, at the top of it here, it's lost its height, and same here. It's lost. And this is exactly the same injury that my friend had. He just injured two of his vertebrae. Okay. He said, you know, subtle, but he said you've got to, you know, but you can clearly see that, that these two look different to the rest. So, you know, you've identified it, you've referred it to spine, the so spine say, Ah, this is a stable injury. You can have a brace and you'll be fine. Okay. Now, for Tahini, last question. This is for the bonus point. Okay. This is for the bonus point. Now, this is where it gets He said, Spine said this one is fine. He said, The patient doesn't need an operation. He just needs to have a, like a brace to wear as a little bit of support. But he said, It will heal fine. You'll have no problems. Now, look at. This CT scan here, again, I can't tell you which one it is because I can't see the S1. Mm -hmm. But let's just say anyway, it's L2, whatever, it doesn't matter. This vertebra here, you can see that it's, it's broken. Okay. Now, yes. does, does this injury look better or worse than this injury? Oh, worse, way worse. Yeah, it was. Well, thank you, Andrew, for putting the codes in. You can see that. If you look at this, let's go back to this one. This, as I imagine, the, the vertebrae like building blocks, okay, like the, the bricks in the house. And you need to have solid bricks, you know. And yes, even though this, these ones, these vertebrae have lost their shape, they're still, they still have their height. So if you look here, it's still as tall as it should be. It's still as tall as it should be. Yes, at the front, it's lost it a bit. And maybe in the middle, but the back, it's still got its height. Where this 
this is, looks like someone's got a hammer and just smashed it into pieces. So, yes. you know, I wouldn't be confident that that is stable. That looks like something is, that looks like it's going to be unstable. All right. Mm -hmm. The other thing which is subtle, which you may not be able to see, is if you look here, it looks like there's a line here, another fracture. And that's also concerning because there's a fracture at the front and a fracture at the back as well, then all that is very unstable. Okay, so if that person tried to go and walk, this will just move. Okay. And now, again, I don't expect you guys know, to know this. This is what spinal surgeons look at when they go and see. But it all comes down to, well, not all comes down to, but they had this theory. Okay. Oh, sorry, I did it again. So they call it the three column theory. Okay. So the anterior column, which is like the anterior two thirds, you have the middle column and the posterior column. And what the people used to say is that if the fracture only involves the anterior column, then it's stable. If the fracture involves more than two columns, or no, two columns or more, then it's unstable. That was pretty much what I used to think. However, we do know that some the posterior column ones are unstable. Now, I don't want to confuse you because you can get a bit confusing when you think about these different columns, but I think what I want to just get to is how you could appreciate that how these two fractures are different and why on one you think actually you know it, it, that doesn't look too bad you can just manage it without an operation but with this one this looks like this is just going to collapse and crumble and the, the whole spine will just fall okay and if you left so for example if you left this um, fracture here and didn't treat it, what will happen is it will gently crumble and crumble and the patient will develop more kyphosis. So these vertebrae will start to lean forward, okay? And so it's important for this to be recognized. And if you look at this, if you look at the posterior margins, this is sticking out, okay? Remember I told you your, your spinal cord lives here. It doesn't like anything sticking out into it. So you'd be concerned, if I saw this about, oh, wait a second, is the patient's spinal cord affected? You see on, on this one, it's all fine, but on this, you know, you'd be concerned. So just little subtle things, small things, but it just gets you thinking, okay? Just gets you thinking, all right? But very good, very good. You did fantastic there. Now you've got better English than most people. So that's fantastic. <laughs> Uh -huh. I'll keep so practicing. That, no, no worries. Honestly, no, fantastic. Okay, so you see, so we'll move on. We'll move on. Next, I've got is James. James. Okay, so James. We'll move on. So James. So James, we've got this this lady, ninety year old female, comes with back pain. Okay, but she said no trauma. And she tells you that she feels that she's lost height. And they're giving you the picture here. This is what her back looks like. I'll tell you, tell me, James, what, what, what things do you think of? Again, this is a very common. Um, I'm, I'm thinking a sort of degenerative conditions such as arthritis. Oh, good, good. Degenerative condition. I like that. That's 90 year old. Of course, what's it going to be? Likely to be degenerative. Have I told you it's not a degenerative condition? Okay. So this patient probably does have arthritis because every night year old has arthritis. But the arthritis isn't what is causing the, um, her um, is it? Is it the, um, the intervertebral discs are wearing down? Good. Okay, so again, good. Another good. Again, good guess. Now that, that again happens in arthritis. You, know, you get loss of joint space, you get loss of disc space as well. But that's another thing. So it's good, but it's not the right, it's not the correct one in this one. Again, it's a, you're thinking the right way. You're going through the steps. You're thinking, what where could the problem be? Okay. Now, this is probably the most 
well, I'll say the most common one that you will see, elderly patients. So what, if I was to say to you, in, in terms of bones, what problem do elderly patients have compared to like a young person like us? Uh, weakened bones, so like osteoporosis. Fantastic. So they have osteoporosis, weakened bones. Okay. And as you know, if osteoporosis makes your bones weak, and that make, it, it, it makes you more predisposed to fractures. Okay. So they can break their wrist, they can break their hip. Also, what's very common is that vertebra will break. Okay. So they will get fractures in their spine. Okay. And when they get fractures, you know, they, the spine can change its kind of contour. Right? So if you look at this scan, this, this picture here, okay, so now we've got an X-ray. Right? Now this is probably, again, you say, oh, but why would you not get a CT scan? Well, this patient hasn't had any trauma, okay? No trauma. She's just complaining of back pain, all right? So, you know, again, if you're to the radiologist, I'll say, just do an x ray. You know, what do you want a CT scan for? You know, is there, you know, do you think there's a fracture? They, they've had no trauma. So you get an x ray. And this is what the x ray looks like. Now, look at this x ray. Is there anything that you could comment on that you think is not quite right here? Um, I can see a bit of um, intervertebral space narrowing. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. down at the bottom it's sort of making like a weird I want to describe it as like a sec section of Toblerone uh, <laughs> shape Very good. Very um, good. so first, first thing I'm going to ask you is if you look at those bones I mean you've seen bones on x-rays before do they look like they're dense or do they look like they're pretty see-through uh, they're, they're pretty see-through looks like quite mm. brittle yeah, so you look at the vertebrae. I mean, this this looks like the air. Okay, yeah. So you can look, yeah, so you you know you really can't see much in terms of that, right? And there's some other signs. You see some of the discs, the discs, so sort the of disc spaces, so the space in between the vertebrae don't look. They look a bit odd. They just don't look normal, right? And I'll show you what normal looks like. These all look a bit different, okay? But if I can convince you that these like white lines here, that's subchondral sclerosis, the same way that you see subchondral sclerosis in your knee or your hip, okay? What about this vertebra here? What do you think has happened to this vertebra? It's got this shape. Um, as it's sort of like eroded a little bit. Mm -hmm. Not eroded, but you're, you're getting here. Oh, is it, is has it sort of grown like a spur off it? It probably is spurs. But why do you think the shape is different? So like this one here is a perfect square or a rectangle, you want to call it. Why, what's happened to this one? What do you think's happened? If I said that, if you think of vertebrae as bricks and they're one of their, one of their roles is to support the body weight. It supports your body weight. And you said that these look pretty see-through. It looks like it's been compressed slightly. Indeed, indeed. It's collapsed. Or, as you said, it's compressed. And that's all it is. And that's what you call a compression fracture. Okay. Very, very common. All right. And it's the reason why we see a lot of elderly people with backs like this. That's all that's happened. And they'll say that I feel shorter is because their bones have started to collapse. And what happens is it collapses more at the front and the middle than at the back. So, what tends to happen is that they tend to lean forward. And you get that kyphosis kind of thing. So that's literally the main reason. That's one of the main reasons why elderly people I mean, they will get it sporadically. They won't say it's any trauma. They, you know, some people say, "I coughed and it happened." Okay, and they will just come with this back pain with no trauma. But if you did a scan, this is what you see. All right, and it's very common. And people can have multiple of these. Like, like you know, they can have multiple compression wedge fractures throughout the entire spine, and they'll say, "Yeah, I've lost like three inches in height." Now lean forward. All right. So very, very common. Very, very common. Okay. Now, this is just showing you again another one, but a bit more subtle. Okay. One of the things is with compression fractures is that so it affects the front and the middle rather than the back. So 
So the back of the vertebra still maintains its height. But the front and middle tends to just collapse. And you can imagine if this happened in multiple places, what happened is that the whole spine will start to lean forward. Okay. And then that. And so the mainstay of treatment really is just that the spine is stable, even though it's uh, collapsed like this, the spine is stable. Sometimes you can treat it in a brace, but you know, when you try and put 90 year old ladies in spinal braces, they just do not tolerate it at all. So you just say, look, take some painkillers, but treat the underlying problem, which is treat the osteoporosis. Okay. There is something that they can do, it's called a vertebroplasty, which is a procedure where you get literally they get like a what do you call it now? It's like a, something the size of like a pen, and they try and get it from the back. They do it from the back under x-ray guidance uh, through the pedicles and it gets into the vertebra. And it's like the size of a pen. And then they inject cement or well, first a balloon to go through that pen. They blow the balloon up. And what happens is a small balloon being in and it blows the vertebra up. So it's like now nice and big. And then they put cement into that balloon and then it, can, it keeps the bone nice and square. And it's called a vertebroplasty. Yeah. It's not, it's not commonly done. They generally do it like if you've, if you've got like a vertebral compression fracture, which stays painful for a long period of time. What tends to happen is it's painful initially and it compresses, but then it heals and it's fine. Right, but that's just, I think, but very good. Any questions at all? Any questions? This is very common. So you, you'll see this in nearly every elderly patient you, you come across. Especially elderly females. The reason why is postmenopausy, much increased rate of osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. All right, next I've got is Nick. Is Nick around? Nick, you there? Potentially, possibly. We did have we did have a question from. Oh, question. Peter. He asked. Is it usually the superior surface that yes. gets the compression fracture? Yep, yep, your great question, yep. So, yep, it's usually the superior aspect. Okay. I don't know why, I just think maybe that's the situation of pressure, but yeah, it's always the superior, never the inferior. So if you see something that looks like this, it's just called classic wedge fracture. But yeah, good question. Cool. So do we have Nick? Is Nick around? If we don't have Nick, we'll move on. Maybe not. To... Maybe. No, no. So we want to Peter. Is Peter around? Uh, I think Pete was the one. Peter was the one that um, said they were in the library. They couldn't turn no on the mic. Yeah. No worries. No worries. We move on to Ravina. Ravina. Hi, Aaron. Yeah. Hey, Ravina. Don't they sound so reluctant <laughs> <laughs> no i'm not it's all good it's all it's shy yeah, so yeah that's no problem that's no problem i said these are good spinal cases i mean stuff that you probably would would not have seen or you, know, you wouldn't have been taught about this stuff but these are the common let's say common these are yeah common things which you should be able to, be able to find I mean, you, you should find come to see you the things that you should hopefully be able to identify so Next patient is this one, 70 year old man comes. He has new one set, oh, I thought back twice, but central back pain. Okay. And also another clue, which sometimes they don't give you, but I'm gonna give it to you, that he said hematuria in this year for three months. What are you thinking of? Um, I would think of a malignancy. Mm -hmm. Ravina, Ravina, you've done this before, haven't you? <laughs> why why do you think of me um because it sounds like they might have um maybe like a metastatic spinal cord compression okay where do you think the primary is coming from then um the kidneys mm -hmm. or the bladder anywhere uh-huh anywhere else um i think of old men Prostate. Yeah. There you go, prostate, fantastic. So, very good. You think malignancy, and this is another thing you need to think about. So, elderly patients, you'll seem to think, hmm, could there be a malignant process going on? And that's where it's usually quite good to 
get a history of, have they got a history of malignancy? Because metastasis to the spine is very, very common. Or, you know, you need to ask them questions. So in an old lady, you know, you've got very dark from the blood, you've been noticing you breast lumps. You know, the, the common um, malignancies that metastasize are it BT parnomalasia. So it's breast, thyroid, prostate, lung, kidney. You have to remember that, but those are just the ones that, that those are the ones that most likely will metastasize to bone. But this is important. So you think of a bony problem, or we think potential metastases. Also, multiple myeloma. That is like the amount of people who've been diagnosed with multiple myeloma. And the first thing that they, the only thing that they complained about is back pain. That was it, some back pain. You should always do a myeloma screen. Okay, like they just, if there's a routine, anybody, I think pretty much about age like 50 or 40, always do a myeloma screen because they can present this. Okay. And you know, if I see an, an elderly man with back pain, in my head, I'm already thinking, has the patient got prostate problems? So they may, not, they may say, actually, I don't know, pain's fine or that, but I'll just do a, a PSA, a prostate-specific antigen blood test, just in case. All right, so, Ravina, it's done to you. So, at both of these x-rays, well, let's start with x-ray on the left. Okay, let's start with this one. Do you see any abnormality in this x-ray? Uh, no, I'm not sure if I can see anything. Ooh, that's no problem. We're going to move on to, on to the right. What's the abnormality here? One of the vertebrae is a lot more opaque. Yeah. So you said they're all opaque, or is one more sclerotic? Oh, yeah, one would be more sclerotic. Yeah, indeed. So if you looked at them, I'd say, look, this, well, this one's going to be the odd one out, because these ones look okay. Or they look like, you know, yeah, they may be slightly a bit opaque, or are loosened, but this one is like heavily sclerotic. Uh, and you know, normally they're not that, unless you've got like ivory bone disease, I can't see uh, this, this is very sclerotic. Okay, but again, even if you look at this, if you look at this x ray, there's still more cell spans. You see these osteophytes here, Some tiny little osteophytes there, which you can see. If you look at the disc, this disc looks very thin. This disc looks very thin. There's some sclerosis here, there's some osteophytes there. Uh, if you look here, some osteophytes. So you can see, there's a, if I just looked at this, I say that this person's got degenerative you know, changes in their lumbar spine, but it's also got a very sclerotic vertebra. Then again, S1, 2, 3 down here. So that'd be 5, 4, 3, L3. All right. If you look at this one, this one's very subtle, but this vertebra is more loosened compared to the rest. You see, that one looks a bit more see-through compared to the rest of them. All right, so yeah, it's another subtle, it's subtle, it's all very easy, but it's, yeah, it's subtle. So you've got an example here of a lytic and an example of a sclerotic. Right, all right. But then, uh, good. Yeah, and so if you, there were a lot, I mean, it's not, it's not too uncommon, but actually sometimes the first sign of you know, the first that the patient know that they've got cancer is actually just got back pain. Okay, and it's happened to me a few times and I'm you know, examined and x-rayed their back and you can see actually there's a lucency here, there's a there's a there's a change. Right. But good. Very, very good. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay. So we've got meth back disease. All right. Next one. Who's next? Okay. Andrade, I'm going to come back to you because we're going back to the top. All right, now, 45 year old male, it's an IV drug user, it's got back pain and fever. What are you concerned about? Um, I'm concerned about 
him being septic of sepsis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, so yes, he is septic. Okay. And where do you think the source of the sepsis is? Um, after like following the uh, the intravenous um, usage. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that would be the source. That there. So that would be. So, so where do you think the infection is now? And think think about having back pain. And being a spine a spine a webinar, we're always going to have an answer within the spine. So think spine-related foci for infection. Mm. Could it actually be the spinal cord, like? Yeah. Yeah, 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 That's correct. That's correct. Mm. You, what's what's the medical term for infection of, let's say, the layers of the spinal cord, for example? Mm -hmm. Um. Oh, meningitis. Could be, could be. Or let's say, what's the medical term for infection, for example, of uh, bone? Oh. Uh, yeah. So yeah, you got, you're on the right way. You're, you're on the right. You're on the right path. I think Andre is kind of. I'm just trying easing it. Yeah. Because <laughs> you you probably would never have seen this before. But again, this is a common thing. But again, you've picked up what I wanted to do is you're picking up the right things. I really you, I thought you've got a major risk factor. They've also got fever as well. They've got back pain. Okay, so, so their infection can be somewhere in their back. Right? Now, where do you think you can get infection in your back or in the spine? Where do you think you can get infection? I actually saw a comment in the chat and <laughs> It said uh, the situs, like in yeah. the disc. Yeah. yeah, it could be the situs, yeah. Yeah, you get in the disc. You can also get infection in bone. Yeah. Bone is very vascular. So Osteomyelitis, yeah. have you? Yeah. Yeah, oh. right. so the, yeah, so the same way that malignancy gets into your vertebra, is the same way infection gets into your vertebra. There's lots of blood vessels. They get there and they can just spread it and move into there. All right. So with that in mind, okay, with that in mind, I'm going to show you the scan. Right, now, this is where it gets a bit difficult because we haven't seen this scan. <laughs> now I'm moving on to MRI scans. Now, again, why have we got an MRI scan, not a CT scan? Well, CT scans, we said, shows bone very well. Okay. However, MRI scan shows soft tissues very well. Well, you can also see bone, it shows soft tissues more. If you're trying to look for infection on CT scan, you're not going to get many signs. But if you get an MRI scan, it will show you signs. So the radiologist will say, oh yeah, cool, that's fine. You want it, you're, you're considering an infection somewhere in the spine, get an MRI scan. Now, look at these two scans. Is there anything that you can see? Look, so let's start with this one on the left, this scan here. Again, this is the front, this is the back. Let's just forget it. This is an S1. So now you can see them clearly S1, S2, S3, but this one is the sacred. Yeah. Let, let's five. try to try to like say specifically like which level do you think doesn't look doesn't look right? Because you can count. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the intervertebral space between L3 and L4. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, like, yeah. I always come back to the L5, L4, L3. So L3, L4. Why do you think this looks abnormal? What is different about this disc compared to the others? Uh, the others are um, not white, not opaque. Correct. Correct. Now, man, see, Andrade, you, just, you come up with some fantastic, fantastic answers here. This is a lot more white compared to the rest, okay? Why do you think that's the case? Why is it white? What does, what does white on this scan signify? What do you think it is? What else is white on this scan? You remember types of MRI, like, like variations of MRI? T1, T2? Yeah, T1, T2. 
T1, T2, before, what, what so shows on each one? Uh, that's a way harder question. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't worry about that. Don't, don't, honestly, don't worry about T1, T2, because I, I didn't get my mind around that until I was like ST5. Like, honestly, <laughs> but it was only literally until I did a spine job where people kept asking me that, especially when I actually sat down and understood it. But, so, but I think the easier way is, okay, so you can see this is bright. What else is bright in this scan? So what's this on someone's back? The adipose tissue. Yeah, so fat that comes up as white. Okay. Now, again, you've got, you've got lots of fat in your stomach, you've got lots of fat there. Okay, so fat comes up as bright on this scan. However, if you look at this scan here to the right, fat is also white. Okay, but there's a difference between these two scans in terms of you've got white here but it's dark here. All right, now, what, as, I, as you said before, when you look at scans, what runs in this gap here? What is in this gap? In between the vertebra, or in this canal, what, what do you think runs in this canal? The spinal cord. Indeed. So you see this black structure here? That's the spinal cord, that black structure. What do you think the white is then? In that canal. Again, these are difficult questions, man. So if you're answering these, honestly, yeah. fantastic. These are really difficult questions. So okay. what's what's sort of around the cord itself, within the canal, around the cord? Which is white here. Like the layers of yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. So you've got the layers around the spinal cord, you've got the pia matter, you've got meninges, dura, etc. And what do you have like so what do you what have bathing, bathing the layers? Like per se, no, yeah. Bathing the layers. Kinda, kinda, yeah. <laughs> when, when, so the, the, so the next question would be, you've seen people, you may see people do lumbar punctures where they put a needle into the spinal canal. What comes out of the spinal canal when you do a lumbar puncture? Um, the subarachnoid. The um, wait, the Lee, Lee CR is it the CSF? There we go, yeah. there we go. <laughs> so we're getting there, we're getting there. So that white, I mean, you, I think you were, I, I think I'm glad you're just about to say that white is the fluid, cerebrospinal, the cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so the CSF that is the fluid, and so your spinal cord kind of like lies, kind of like. Isn't it, I mean, just like bathes in the fluid is what Andrew was saying, okay. So, on this MRI scan, what is bright is fat and fluid. As you said, your fat and fluid is white. On this MRI scan, only fat is white. So this, I mean, you don't have to learn this, but this is a T2 where you did this is T1, okay, because in T2, the only way I remember it, in T2, water is also bright. And so I just look straight at the spinal cord and the spinal cord, in the spinal canal is white and look, all that is CSF, and that's also bright, okay? So great, so you can see that this disc has lots of white in it, why? Because there's lots of fluid. When there's infection, you get lots of edema, lots of fluid, you get pus. That fluid will show up as white, okay? Another thing you can see is that if you looked at the, so if you looked at these discs at the top, you see how this has got a little bit of brightness, in it, a little bit of whiteness, a little bit of brightness. That's what a normal disc looks like because the uh, nucleus pulposa has a little bit of fluid in it. Okay, you get a little bit of fluid. When your disc starts to become like this, where mainly in black, we describe that as a disc that's become dehydrated. And when that happens, you can see how this disc is bulging slightly. Okay, see how these discs don't bulge? Like you can literally draw a straight line, but you can see that this disc is bulging, but it's just here. And it's lost its fluid. This one is bulging a bit. Lost its fluid. But in it, as you correctly said, there's lots of uh, fluid in there, and that is showing this discitis, this infection inside this disc. And of course, it will spread into the vertebrae. And if you look at this, this is the same patient but just on a T1 weighted image. And you can see the fat, because in your bone, you have lots of fat, and that's why it's bright on this image, really bright. But you can see that this, the 
these two vertebrae here, the L two to three, is really like something something not so good is happening. Now is it? So you've literally been able to. But if you gave this to most people, the, like most all three measures are on, unless they've done spines, they wouldn't be able to understand what's going on here because it can be quite daunting. But you say if you just go through those things, you can you can see exactly what the problem is. And it's yeah. with spine, I think it's always good to just compare. Try and if everything's bad, then you can't compare. But you try and compare with what you think looks normal. So you just go up a level, up a level, up a level. Try and find a normal level, a normal mm -hmm. vertebrae, and then compare and see. All right, it looks darker, looks smaller, looks shorter. There's lines, there's no lines, uh, and mm -hmm. if you can spot the difference, it's already halfway, halfway exactly. there. That's the thing. It's really, really, really. That's a, that's a really good thing. You just I by looking because the, sorry, the spine is the same part. All these vertebrae and the discs are the same, pretty much going up. So you know, look at the ones above and you go, okay, that looks. These ones look pretty normal, but that just looks very different. And then you know, describe what the differences are. And you say you're pretty much halfway there. But very good. So again, it's the treatment for this. Is infection here. Okay, so in a patient with that, you know, you'll do blood cultures, okay, and you'll try to get what the pathogen is. Of course, IFEDU most likely to be a staph aureus. And then you, know, you speak to the microbiologist, they'll say, okay, you know, this patient's going to be six to eight weeks of, I don't know, fruit oxacillin or something. Blah, blah, blah. If this infection was much worse to the point that it was causing the bones to crumble, which can happen if it's left for long standing, the spine can become unstable, then it needs an operation. Okay. But initially, but, it, but majority of them just need antibiotics for a long period, for a sustained period of time to clear the infection. Okay. Any questions at all? This is quite common. Okay? You see a lot of people with this, especially people with you know, IVDUs, et cetera, the ones who tend to get this. All right, we move on to the next one. Okay, so, okay, so we've got osteomyosis, guys. So we have come with all this stuff on the bone, all right? So when I think that these are, it's, it's, you've got fractures, you've dislocations, metastases, infection. All right, good, excellent. So we'll move on. Who is next? So what's the time? Who is next? Antonio, can I grab you? Yeah. Come on, Antonio. So this guy comes in to eat, and he's a 40 year old laborer. So he does, he just puts bricks and stuff every day, fixing stuff. He's had two months of lower back pain. He says, started after he bent down to lift the sofa. Okay. What do you think has happened? And what do you think is wrong? Um, okay, quick question. Do you think he's got any of these? No. Okay, do you think he's got do you think he's got a fracture? Do yeah. you think he's dislocated? Do you think he's got metastasis or infection? No. No. Okay, cool. So already you can think he ain't got none of that stuff. Already from the history you got already. So what do you think could have happened to him? Uh, a disc, a herniated disc, possibly. That's fantastic. Good, good. So now you're starting to think of other things that can go wrong. You said the spine simple. You said, you know, if it's not the bone, it most likely it's going to be the disc. All right. And again, what things, again, I give you hints. The guy's a laborer. So lots of heavy lifted back stuff. Started off, they bent down to lift the sofa. One of the classic things, they bend down to pick something up. You put a lot of stress on your back. Now, oh, we come back to the spine, MRI spine. Now, Antonio. If you need any help, just get, get Andrada on it. She, she... <laughs> <laughs> Andrada, he's our in-house um, radiologist for this evening. But um, <laughs> yeah. Antonio, so we're going to focus on this image here. Yeah. Okay, so what do you think is abnormal here? You can see like a prolapse, the, the nucleus is going into the 
mm -hmm. the spinal cord it's coming okay. out so. which, which disc what, uh, which disc is that between l4 and l5 fantastic so again this is the sacrum here this one's l5 this one's l4 okay and you see that bulging there okay if you look at the other discs they're not doing that this this is bulging there Again, you can see the normal color, normal brightness you'd find in a disc, just sort of lost it, right? So you can see that this is, yeah, a bulge in the When we see, see like this, we call it, it's from L4 or L5. We see it from the top or from the bottom? No, you say it's the disc between L4, L5. Okay. Yeah, so it's called the L4, L5 disc. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so it's a disc, yeah, L4, L5 disc. And then you can see here, here's your spinal cord, these little black things there, your spinal cord. This is the cerebrospinal fluid. Okay. And that's it, that's what you need. And again, if you look at this one, it's a yeah, pretty much similar thing, L4, L5. Okay. And you see that this disc has lost its, you know, the brightness which you'd get is bulging. You probably said that this disc is probably bulging a bit as well you see quite clearly the spinal cords nice and thick here it starts to become looser all right or not uh, thinner as it goes down but that's that right? you diagnose the patient all right okay and said so, you know you wouldn't do a ct then just from the story that you've got you wouldn't get a ct scan because you've looked at ct scans you can see a ct scan won't show you this disc it okay, will show you the problem, so you know from this history that actually what I need is an MRI scan rather well than that. Okay, and so going further on, I mean, I said, yes, you can problem with the disc. Now, this patient hasn't got any nerve problems or neurology, but this is you know why they can get neurology. So you can have a disc problem which can cause a neurological. Um, no, neurological abnormality. Okay, so it's um, something to just bear in mind for these discs, as you can see, your spinal cord will come down and they, you know, you've got nerves exiting at each level. So you can see that they can come in close contact. All right, very good. So, well, this is very good. So, what I'm going to do just for the sake of time, we still have quite a few to go through, and then this weirdest time. I'll go, what I'll do is I'll talk you through the next the next few ones. Is that all right? Because I'm just worried about time. Yeah, yeah, it would be good because uh, we're running up to an hour now. Yeah, yeah. sorry about that. Yeah. All right, so an hour forty. Yeah, it's it, people start to get tired. But yeah, people get tired. Okay, cool. So we'll we'll, we'll wrap. We'll, we'll go through the next ones. And I'll just definitely again talk to you about the. Okay, so we talked about disc herniation. Discitis, again, is similar to the one we showed before about the, you know, the osteomyelitis. They kind of they kind of present exactly the same, really. So only the MRI scan is differentiating goes to discitis and osteomyelitis. But usually, the it starts with a discitis and then spreads into the bone and osteomyelitis. Now this one, eight-year-old man, feels unstable on his feet. Weakness and clumsiness finds it difficult doing on buttons. And he says sometimes he gets a tingling in his limbs, but it's random. Not always in the same spot, doesn't really follow a dermatome. Okay. Now this is again is another, I'd probably say this is probably the most common problem we've seen in elderly people. Yeah, I would say that, yeah, elderly people with a spine clinic, but it's so frequently missed because. If, you, if someone came to you and said, look, an eight-year-old man is feeling a bit wobbly on his feet, he's a bit weak, a bit clumsy, you just think this is just old age. That's what a lot of times they, they, they present with such small, um, not so subtle symptoms. But actually, one of the key things is they find it difficult to use their hands. So they say, My, I can't do a button. The uh, handwriting has changed. That is a common. And when you can hear, oh, they've got paresthesia as well. In my head, you just got to think of something neurological. The unstable on their feet. So some of them will say, it feels like I'm drunk. I just can't I have to walk with a wide face. It's classic for something called cervical myelopathy. Right? And cervical myelopathy, is that what we see here? This is the cervical spine. 
And what you can see is that you can see the discs here don't look too happy and they're pushing onto the spinal cord. And that is all it is. And it's very, it's common in elderly patients. People just think, oh, this elderly people slowing down. No, it's not. It's that they've got, this is part of, if I look at this, I say those patients have got arthritis, cervical spine. So changes, which is the signal of arthritis. And you see it's pushing onto the spinal cord. And you can see the spinal cord should be a nice dark color. You can see just here, there's a brightness in it. That's showing that's edema. So there's, there's swelling within the spinal cord. And that is what causes the symptoms. The swelling is there. It's in the nerves. So because it's so high up, it just gives them this like myriad of changes. But one of the changes that they always complain about is they struggle with clumsiness. Um, they get like a, they feel their balance has changed and is bad. Okay. And then they just struggle to use their hands. And really, the only treatment for that is you need to make, you need to decompress the spinal canal. So you need to have operation where they go in and they'll remove this disc, usually from the front, from the disc so that the spinal canal has space. Because otherwise, what just happens is it progressively gets worse. It's a progressive thing. They don't say static, they're just year after year, they'll get worse and worse. And I've seen people come in and they're just wheelchair bound. The problem is, as you know, with anything in, with nerves, once nerves go, they don't really recover. So, you know, before it gets too bad, you um, intervene. Okay, so that's that case. This case, 45 year old, high BMI, chronic back pain with right leg numbness. So, in my head, I was already thinking someone with the BMI of 40 is putting a lot of stress on their lower back. Okay, whatever they're doing, it's all their weight on their lower back all the time. So, these people are more likely to have disc related problems. So, that's why they have the chronic back pain. But they right leg numbness. Some figure they've got fatigue, they've got a disc pushing on a nerve, which is affecting their, their right leg. I'm interested in that. And now, this morning, both legs are numb. Interesting. She's also wet herself this morning. So, that to me is already red flag signal thinking, has this patient got a cord to require now? All right. If you look at this MRI scan, you can clearly see here, yeah, these, the bottom three discs here don't look happy. Right, they've lost their uh, fluid. So this one's not bulging too bad. That one's bulging. This is bulging out. Okay. Completely including the canal. Right. But you can only see this on one view. If you look here, remember C these are the axial views. Okay, this is L45, so that's this region here. Okay. That is the or where the vertebra is with the disc. It's difficult to see, but you can see this little triangle here. The whiteness in there is the fluid around the spinal cord, and little dots that should be the nerves, the cord acquired. If you look at it here, that's pretty much been obliterated by a black blob, okay? And that's the disc. And that's really all you can see. So if you look at that, you'd be like, look, there's no space in that canal anymore. For the, it's difficult, I should really enlarge this, but that's what you look at. And that's quarter required. Okay, it's compression of the horse's tail. And once you start to get you know, bowel or bladder issues, it's be serious because those nerves do not recover quickly. And so if you do not manage it and go in and decompress, those patients will now be left with permanent incontinence or retention, which is again a disaster to live with. Because it tends to not happen in terribly old people, it tends to happen in people in their 40s, 50s. So Big red flags. Next one, 65 year old male, pain in the legs when walking. We're going to find it easier when walking in the supermarket or walking uphill. That's a mild lower back pain. Okay, so, and it's when you think of pain in the legs when walking, you always think, oh, is it related to their joints? So they got arthritis. But then these people will complain of a pain. It's like a general aching in their legs. And then you think, oh, there's something like that, like a vascular claudication or something. But the signs which make it not that is when they walk uphill, they find it easier. And if it was a vascular cause, it'd be worse. And they also say, oh, when I'm in the supermarket, it helps. And the reason why is when in the supermarket, they have a trolley and they're bent over. And especially when you walk uphill, you tend to lean forward so you bend over more. And that tends to help. And the main the reason why this happens is something called lumbar stenosis. So, 
some of those pictures of Corda are quite similar, but not as bad. As you can see here in that triangle, you see the white is fluid. The little dots on the nerves, individual nerves. What happens is, is it gets really narrow to the point that you struggle to see the fluid. So the nerves are really bunched up, and that's what lumbar stenosis is. Okay. Other things you can see is that it's not really that the disc, I mean, there is a little bit of disc there, but these are facet joints. Okay, these bits here, facet joints. So you see they're much smaller here where there's space, but they're much bigger here in the middle of space left. And these are just part of wear and tear process in the spine. Okay, and then try to get this thing called lumbar stenosis, neuro, neuro, neurogenic complication. Okay, and again, the management for this is you just have to go in there and decompress. But again, that's a common thing, and I think a common question they like in EMQs or MCQs, trying to differentiate between neurogenic and vascular cortication. Right. But yeah, is there any questions on that? That's quite a good one, but they always find it easier when they bend forward. Okay, and the walking, yeah, walking uphill, which is another telltale sign. All right, moving swiftly on. Get another one. X I V U. Two weeks of back pain feels a bit under the weather. Infection too proven otherwise. Right. If I see an I V D U, they're infected until not. Again, MRI scan better for infection. You can see that this disc just looks a mess, and then you've got this large swelling here. Okay, and what it is is you've got discitis, and now they formed an abscess. And that abscess is in the spinal canal. Okay, so something like this likely would be draining because we can see that it's starting, it's starting to affect the spiral cord, so they have to go in there, drain it. Okay, but again, now you thought this patient has an infection, best to get an MRI scan, and that's what it shows. Turn out first. So, really, when it gets to the spinal cord, we're pretty much, when I think of if people have issues with the spinal cord, these are the things I think of. I mean, yeah. Here from there, all right. I think there's only just a few more bits, well, like two or three more. Yeah, two or three more. Well, so we'll crack on quickly. A 50 year old pins and needles in the right oh, middle finger, weakness when pushing doors open. All right, and if you go back to your Asia score, the pins and needles in the right middle finger makes you think, oh, no, they've got a bit of carpal tunnel. But normally, carpal tunnel, you also have the thumb and the index finger and half of your ring finger as well. But, you know, with this type of what we call radiculopathy, it doesn't usually fit that. And also weakness when pushing doors open. And that's because you use your triceps to open the door, you extend your elbow, okay? And this is a, what we call a C7 radiculopathy. So your C7 nerve root, which does sensation to your middle finger and also helps you use your triceps, is that and you see that there that this C C sixty seven disc is protruding. Now this is again this is the disc here. You know it's difficult to see. That's the spinal cord because it's all bunched together when it's high up in there. Here's the fluid around the spinal cord and there's a disc. Okay now and what tends to happen is there's a nerve that runs out here. And so that the disc is a question of nerve and that is it. Again, if you have your age of score and you did the full neurological examination, it would just tell you there's a problem with CSA. And then you know you can get taken from there. This is probably the most common thing you would ever see, which is, and I get this a lot, is you're doing arthroplasty, then you refer to patient with knee pain. And the first thing they say to me, yeah, it feels like a shooting sensation in my leg, or an electrical shock or burning. As soon as they say that, I'm like, your, your problem is an arthritis. The problem with sciatica, okay? And the distribution of sciatica, they tend to feel the pain all the way down the leg, okay? It really from the from the, you know, the buttock really all the way down to the foot. There may be associated paresthesia. And if it's long-standing, they will also get uh, weakness as well. He said, if any of these nerve roots are being compressed, usually by a disc, they will then get some problems down the entirety of the sciatic nerve. This is extremely common. But for most people, it resolves after six weeks. But if it persists, 
you may need you know to go in there and decompress the nerve root which has been affected so that's pretty much yeah, the two peripheral nerves so what i call lumbar radiculopathies this is just you see when we see this a lot over here this elderly people with worsening neck pain nothing wrong with them Nothing, nothing wrong with it. There's no abnormal neurology, but the seven year old person, X minor, if you guys just got wear and tear and arthritis. That's pretty much it. This is what arthritis and cycle spine sees like. Your discs get narrowed, you've got these you know, osteophytes. And these are normal looking discs, per se, no, uh, vertebra. And then you can see that the disc spaces here are narrowed. The subconscious sclerosis is much more whiter here. And that's this, you know, arthritis of the spine. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you saw on the lumbar, you see this looks a lot more I mean, loss of joint space, osteophyte, subconscious stresses. I admit, subconscious cysts are not easy to perceive, but you know, if it's a sore spine like this, you say this person definitely got arthritic changes. They call it spondylosis, but don't worry about the, the, the thing. You, know, you say arthritis in the spine, everyone knows what you're talking about. This is a slightly different. And it's subtle again, but if you, this person's got arthritis of the spine, okay, but you can see there's a slight mismatch here. Okay, you can follow that line here, and we'll drag it out. Okay, and they call that, it's called degenerative spondylolisthesis. Don't worry about what the name is, literally just, they got such wear and tear that this part of the spine starts to slip. And so you can say that this L4 has slipped anterior to L5. Okay, so degenerative policy. What tends to happen is that the nerve root that comes out here tends to get squashed. Uh, it happens in, yeah, due to significant wear and tear. Uh, so these are really the only two degenerative ones that you can really come across. And last but not least, the inflammatory one. 24 year old male, usually a young man with buttock pain, usually bilateral buttock pain. Which is actually a sacred iliac joint, is what they're complaining of, but they, they call it back at pain. And the back stiffness worse in the morning. Okay. And they usually have someone in the family who looks like this. And that's you know, ankylosing spondylitis. And you can see here this in sites, the bamboo spine appearance. All right. Very good. I think we've covered pretty much everything I think you probably need to know about the spine. Is there any questions at all?